This is Chapter 7, Anatomy, Physiology, and Medical Terminology. So this gentleman right here, they are in the, uh, he is in the, uh, what's called the universal anatomical position. And uh, when you're referencing a part of the body, either over the radio to a doctor or nurse, or you're doing it in writing in your narratives, you're always going to reference this position, this person standing in right there. Uh, the front of the body is called the anterior portion of the body. The back of the body is the posterior portion of the body. And uh, for instance, let's say this gentleman right here, uh, he had a laceration to the inside of his right wrist. Well, how you would describe that is not the inside of the right wrist, but actually the anterior portion of the right wrist because anterior is towards the front and the palms and the wrist that's injured is facing forward. Also remember too that there's a, it's the patient's left side and the patient's right side. If you're facing the patient, if you're making eye to eye contact, uh, everything is flipped. Their right is your left. So, so always want to reference, uh, it's always the patient's right, and it's always the patient's left. So these are various positions you're either going to find the patient in upon arrival or you might even place this person in these positions uh, due to their condition. The first one is called the supine position. Uh, that just means they're flat on their back like you see in the picture. And if, if you wrote the term supine on your documentation or you stated the person was found supine during the narrative of your radio report, the nurse, the doctor, the other EMTs, other paramedics, they'd understand exactly what you meant. You found the patient lying on their back, medical terminology. If a person is uh, dizzy, if their blood pressure is low, and you find them sitting up or standing up upon arrival, you want to lay them down as, in a supine position to increase blood flow to the head to decrease the dizziness. So we'll actually place people in this supine position uh, due to their medical conditions. If a person is having a traumatic injury where their neck or back is injured, we'll place them also in, in, in this supine position because it, it helps to stabilize that, that spinal column. The prone position is a, a rather unnatural position, as you can see in the picture. Uh, but this is face down, and you might document found the patient lying face down in the dirt. Uh, again, this is not natural. This, this is trying to you're trying to express that they were face down, and but on top of that, think about it: would you want to be face down in the dirt? It more than likely means this person's not conscious or has some kind of altered mental state. And when it comes to the prone position, uh, this person needs to get rolled over pretty quickly so we can assess their airway. But again, you'll document the term prone. Now, lateral recumbent positions, there's two of them. There's left lateral and right lateral recumbent. Um, these you might have learned in, e in um, CPR class. Uh, they think they call it the recovery position. And as you learned, when someone comes out of cardiac arrest or they're semi-conscious after they recovered, we want to put them on their side for a couple of reasons. One, it draws the tongue forward away from the back of the throat, so it opens up the airway. And if they have any secretions like uh, saliva or vomitus, it exits their mouth rather than going down into their lungs. Now we put people into lateral recumbent positions during transport for a number of reasons. Uh, one of those, of course, is to control the airway. But also, if, if we have a, a female who's, uh, who's pregnant, we want to get her on her side. It takes the weight of the baby off of her uh, blood vessels and it increases blood flow to the heart. If we uh, if we have a woman who's, you know, six, seven, eight months along in her pregnancy, and we lay her flat on her back in the supine position, the weight of the of the baby and the amniotic fluid presses down on some major uh, organs in her abdominal cavity and reduces flood, blood flow to the heart, which then reduces blood pressure, which reduces the amount of perfusion getting to the baby. So we, 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 we want this woman to be in this lateral position. Left lateral is preferred for a couple of reasons. One, it takes the most of the weight off the organs. And two, if you're in the back of an ambulance and you're the EMT, you're going to be sitting on the right side of the ambulance on the bench seat. 
and you'll have the patient facing you so you'll be able to observe their airway and talk to them. Now, people who, who have had strokes, uh, we talked a little bit about strokes, I think in chapter one or so, but this person has some kind of stroke and they have paralysis to one side of their body or the other. Uh, strokes usually affect only one side of the body. Uh, we're gonna place them on the affected side in this lateral position, whatever side's affected. And this does a couple of really great things. One, it makes the, feel, makes the patient feel more in control of their body, gives them some stability, and also it gives us access to their good side of their body so we can take a blood pressure and a pulse on that unaffected limb. Now Fowler's position, Fowler's is probably the most common position you'll wind up transporting a patient in. Um, we call this the position of comfort um, because usually these people are awake and alert to some extent and they will dictate to you how they want to sit. So when I place somebody on a gurney I'll always ask them, are you comfortable? Would you like to sit up a little more? Or would you like to lie, lie back a little further? Uh, there's three basic positions of Fowler's. There's high Fowler's, which is pretty much straight up and down. Uh, someone who's short of breath, that's probably a, a common position of comfort they want to be in, sitting straight upright. This is Fowler's, as you, this girl is in the picture. This is about 60 degrees. And again, we don't have protractors. We're not going to sit there with our little, you know, checking the angles of degree and all that, but approximately about, about 60 degrees back. It's kind of like a Barca lounger kind of comfort. And then we have what's called semi-fowlers, which is about 15 degrees um, and back. This is the person who can't lay flat, but maybe they're a little dizzy. We'll lay them down to where they can find a, a position of comfort, which is around 15 degrees or so. Probably the most common places you're going to, positions you're going to put them in. Now the body is split up into various anatomical planes. Uh, you can see it, there's one that divides right down the midline. Technically we're, in, we're, a, we're a symmetrical being, so the right and left should somewhat match up with some minor differences. We're also split uh, posteriorly and anteriorly down this mid-axillary line down under the armpit right here. Uh, the body, if you, go, you, you go down towards the feet, that's inferior. If you go up towards the head, that's superior. You also notice there's some other terminology. Um, there's a term called medial versus lateral. So medial is towards the midline and lateral is away from the midline. So if you were to move your arm, if you had your arms at your side and you moved your, your arm out away from your body, you're moving it laterally away from your body. If you draw that arm back in towards your body, you're moving it medially. I'm sure you've gone, maybe gone to the gym and you've done uh, those adductor, abductor exercises where you sit in the chair and you squeeze your legs uh, either out or in. So if you're squeezing in, you're adducting, and that's medially. If you're squeezing out against resistance, that's abducting, and that's, again, that's laterally position. So the, the way we, we use these terms in, in our, our business is uh, if I were to get stabbed on the inner thigh, uh, my inner right thigh, you could, you could express over the radio to the nurse that I have a two-inch laceration to the, to the medial side of my uh, upper right leg, and that nurse or doctor would understand it's the inside of the thigh. Uh, if I had a, an abrasion to the outside of my of my left thigh, or you could say I have an abrasion to the lateral side uh, or the lateral aspect of my upper uh, left thigh. So we use these terms to describe locations on the body. Uh, the other one you need to know about is proximal versus distal. Uh, this refers to points of attachment and is usually in reference to the long bones, the limbs. You can see in this picture right here. So proximal means closest to the point of attachment or closer to the point of attachment, and distal is further away. So talking about the uh, upper limb, the arm, uh, the elbow is distal. It's further away from the shoulder. So the that will be a true statement. The elbow is distal to uh, the shoulder, but it's proximal to the wrist. 
So when you have a you have a an injury to a limb, and let's say this woman has broken her her left arm, and she has deformity and pain to her limb, you're going to check distal pulse motor and sensation. You're going to check her fingers and make sure she has a pulse and make sure that her fingers can move and she has good perfusion to her to her hand because that injury to her arm might have cut off the flow of blood or in, or impinged a nerve in her arm so you're going to check distal pulse motor sensation to that injured injured hand so again we use this this terminology describing where we're looking for things and where we find things just be really familiar with distal versus proximal and lateral versus medial and be aware of the various planes, how the body is divided up as you see here in these pictures. Now the chest, this is the thorax. So this is divided up the same way. You have a midline, you have a midclavicular line, which is the nipple line essentially. You have a midaxillary line. Same plane, same lines, essentially, as you, we talked about a little bit earlier. These numbers that you see that I put on the picture right here, these are landmarks uh, for checking lung sounds. The number one right there, uh, that's second or third intercostal space at the mid-clavicular mm -hmm. line, and that's the first place we're going to listen to lung sounds. Uh, we're going to listen separately one side and then the other. We're comparing left to right, right to left. doesn't matter which way you start, but you want to compare one side to the other. Have the person open their mouth. Have the person take a breath in and out. Listen to air moving through their lungs. Listen for any abnormal breath sounds. Next, you're going to go to, to, uh, to number two here. It's, it's the uh, mid-axillary line here, and it's the fourth, fifth, or sixth vertebrae at... Uh, the mid axillary line, and you're going to do the same thing. Listen to the right side, the left side, left side, right side, back and forth. You're going to compare one side to the other, and finally, you're going to you're going to go posteriorly to the back side of the person. And there's the bones are called the scapula. These two triangular bones at the bottom of these two triangular bones, the subscapular area. You're going to listen back there as well. Do the same thing. So there's six total fields that you're going to be listening. Uh, four to listen to lung sounds in a pre-hospital environment. So first is second or third intercostal right there at the nipple line. The second one is going to be mid-axillary around the fifth or sixth intercostal space and then posteriorly at the subscapular angle uh, of that bone. Let's talk about the abdominal cavity. So the abdominal cavity is broken up into four quadrants, upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. We use these points of reference when we're assessing a person's abdominal cavity, uh, points of palpation, looking for signs of distension or, or pain. Now the organs themselves, let's talk about those briefly. So in the upper right quadrant, the predominant organ there is gonna be the liver. The liver is a solid organ. It's full of blood. It filters blood. That's its purpose. And it also creates bile for digestion. Now, if the liver is damaged by blunt or penetrating trauma, a gunshot wound or a car accident, the liver can bleed profusely and, and cause the person to go into shock. Uh, people do also get liver disease. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver is very common in people who are chronic alcoholics. Uh, liver cancer is possible as well. If the liver itself starts to fail, uh, the liver will not be able to filter uh, very well and toxins can back up and the person's skin can actually turn a yellowish color. It's, it's, uh, it's called jaundice and it's a sign of the uh, liver has failed. Behind the liver, you have a, do a hot dog shaped uh, object and that's your pancreas and the pancreas uh, it produces insulin and glucagon. There are two hormones that control your blood sugar. And the same organ also produces a, an enzyme for digestion. Back there as well is the gallbladder. And the gallbladder is that green looking thing hanging there. And that stores the bile that's produced by the healthy liver. And then there's bile ducts that allow that bile to go into your digestive tract to help digest your food. People do get blocked bile ducts, and they get what's called cholecystitis, which is a gallbladder attack, 
which leads to abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting. It's very uncomfortable, not life-threatening usually. Uh, back there as well is you see there's the esophagus and the stomach. Uh, those are part of your digestive system. Uh, food goes down your esophagus into your stomach and water is drawn off. Nutrients are drawn off. The food product goes into your small intestine. That process continues. And by the time it gets to your large intestine, uh, it's a kind of a dry, pulpy substance. Once it gets into your large intestine, your ascending, transverse, and descending colons, it um, gets more water put back in. And between water and pressure from the colon, creates stool. And then that stool is transferred down into an area called the vault, and that's where there's stretch receptors, and that's when it tells you you have to go to the bathroom. Now, uh, another couple of organs, you have the uh, appendix. If you look on the right lower side of the ascending colon, there's a little teeny, kind of looks like a, like a French fry hanging down, and that's your appendix. And the appendix is a hollow organ, and its purpose is to store healthy bacteria to main the, maintain a proper flora and fauna uh, for, your di, for your digestive tract. Sometimes, unfortunately, it gets impacted with bad bacteria and you get, you get appendicitis. Uh, this can swell uh, and then eventually, unfortunately, it can rupture and all that bad bacteria can spill out into your abdominal cavity and lead to what's called peritonitis and then sepsis. And then if it's not treated within a reasonable amount of time, and you can die from it. Uh, the other organ I'll talk about is called the spleen. The spleen is in the upper left quadrant uh, behind the stomach. And the spleen stores blood cells. It's a solid organ. And uh, if it were to be ruptured by impact, um, then it can, you can bleed out and go into shock from that. Now, the skeletal system. We'll go through top to bottom here. So on the top, you have the skull. And um, all I can say about this, if you look at the picture right there, you look at the top of the skull uh, in that picture right there, it sort of kind of looks like an egg. You, you go in the morning in the kitchen, you, you take an egg out of the, out of the icebox, and you're going to go make yourself a scrambled egg. Well, it's, it's just kind of the same thing. What you have here is you have this this very strong outer shell and inside this outer shell you have very fragile contents. Now in an egg you have a yolk and you have the white part of the of the egg and all that. A future chicken I guess what it comes down to. Inside this egg here you've got a brain and you've got a brain stem and you have some very important organs here just as fragile as that yolk inside that egg you're cooking. So anytime someone strikes their head uh, I'm concerned whether, one, did they crack their egg? But think about it. So you can, you, can, you, can, you can drop an egg. The shell doesn't have to essentially shatter, but the yolk can break inside the egg. It's same thing with the brain. You can slam your head into something, have no outward signs of injury, but still the very soft and delicate tissue of the brain can be damaged by that blunt force to the head. So again, you don't have to have a fracture to the skull to have a serious brain injury. Now, there's various bones of the head, the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the occipital bones, the back of the head back, back here, the temporal bone on the side where the mastoid bones are. Um, you notice also when it comes to the eye orbits, you have the frontal bone, the nasal bone, the zygomatic bone, and the uh, uh, maxilla, they kind of, those bones all make up the eye orbits where your eyeballs are in. Those are, the eyeballs are held in place with muscle and soft tissue and ligaments and things like that. Um, the zygomatic bones, are, these are their cheekbones, they're very fragile and they can be shattered pretty quickly or pretty easily. Uh, behind the, the, the zygomatic bones, there are sinuses, sinus cavities, so if you were to get punched in the face, and the bone were to shatter and blood vessels would be torn, that blood could go down into your, through your sinuses, down to the back of your throat. And if you weren't conscious, you could aspirate that into your lungs or swallow it down into your stomach, which would cause you to either vomit 
up blood, which then again, you could aspirate that into your lungs. And aspiration of blood and stomach contents into your lungs is, is very life-threatening. So that's why, you know, when you have someone who's semi-conscious or unconscious and they've been struck in the face and they're bleeding down the back of their throat, this is what we do best. We are airway technicians. We want to, we want to control that airway with suctioning and positioning and things that you, some things we've already learned about. Now, if you look at this other picture up here, the basilar skull plate, what, you're, what, what this picture is, is the top of the skull has been taken away. You're, you're looking down inferiorly. You're down, looking down towards the feet into the actual skull. And that's the, the bottom plate where the brain rests uh, there. So there's, there's a membrane that covers, a thin membrane that covers, that's kind of like a hammock that the brain rests on. But if you were to, to, to remove that hammock, this is what you would see. You notice how the, the basilar plate is, is rather jagged. Um, and if the brain were to be sloshed around by a blunt force impact, the brain could be torn and damaged by these, these sharp bones that are in this basilar plate. Also, we do get patients who get basilar skull fractures. Uh, you'll notice these two pictures of these two patients. This one person has raccoon eyes. And that person has battle signs. And these are both signs of a basilar skull fracture. So a small fracture has occurred on the basilar plate. There's bleeding and there's fluid loss. Usually it's cerebral spinal fluid and blood. It seeps through the crack of the fracture and it starts to pool in these areas. And over a period of time, usually hours after the injury, you start seeing this echomosis, this discoloration caused by this leaking fluids. So someone, uh, I've gone on a number of calls over my career where this uh, gentleman had a car accident the day before. He felt fine. He was not injured, supposedly. He goes to bed that night. He's fine. He wakes up the next morning and he's got two black eyes. And his wife calls 911 and you get there and you hear the story. And sure enough, he was in an accident 24 hours ago. He, he did strike his head on the, on the steering wheel, but he didn't think anything of it. So in this impact, he had fractured his basilar plate and had no initial symptoms. But now after the next 12 hours, 14, 18 hours later, this fluid leaks out, creating these, these signs that we can see. So raccoon eyes and battle signs are a fairly late sign. Uh, one of the earliest signs, of course, you might see is because these are fluids leaking out, they can leak out of the ear or leak out of the nose. So you might see someone with a uh, a mechanism that's telling you they hit their head and they have this fluid coming from their nose or their ears and it might be mixed with blood and that's cerebral spinal fluid and blood kind of mixed together and that's telling you that they might have a basilar skull fracture. Um, what else on this? So when I look at at any time someone's been injured, their head's been struck in any way, whether it's through an assault or falling off their bicycle or a car accident or falling off a ladder, whatever it is. But when someone says, I hit my head, I think of three things immediately to check. One is mental status because the brain is very susceptible to, to injury. And one of the earliest signs of a brain injury is, is a change in mental status. This person is going to act confused, disoriented, agitated, or even unconscious. So you're going to see a person changing away from their normal st mental state to something that's abnormal now. So I, I check their mental status. How are you doing, sir? Do you know where you are? Do you know the day of the week it is? Do you know what happened today? All that ask those questions. If they appear confused or disoriented, you've got to guess this might be a brain injury. Um, I'm going to make sure that their neck's okay because the head's fairly large. It's fairly heavy in proportion to the neck and the support that the neck has. So if you strike your head, you can damage your, your neck, which could damage some type of spinal cord uh, problems there. So I'm going to consider spinal motion restriction, try to have someone maybe hold the person's head and neck in place while I do my assessment to rule that out. And I'm concerned about, of course, airway. Now this is, I, I'm, this is whatever, in whatever priority you want to do this in, but these are the three things you want to think about is, is the airway intact? Are they bleeding down the back of their throat? Can they swallow? Are they having secretion problems? 
Do they have any kind of mental status changes and could their neck be injured? Uh, those are the three big ones I'm worried about when it comes to any kind of damage or injury to the to the skull. Now I talked about the spinal column. There's 33 vertebrae total on average. There's seven cervical vertebrae. There's 12 thoracic vertebrae. There's five lumbar, five sacral, and four coccyx. The sacral and coccyx are fused, and the sacrum that triangular bone at the bottom there actually makes up the posterior portion of your pelvis. Um, more than likely, the area most injured in an accident is going to be cervical. It's the least supported uh, and it's the smallest bone structure. In the cervical vertebrae, uh, we have, of course, the spinal cord going down all the way down to about the lumbar uh, portion of your uh, spinal column. But in the cervical area, we also have what's called a phrenic nerve, and the phrenic nerve is around the fifth, uh, around the uh, fifth cervical vertebrae, somewhere in the fourth or fifth range, somewhere in there. And that phrenic nerve is what controls your diaphragm for breathing. So if you were to break your neck and and damage your phrenic nerve, you could actually stop breathing. That's that's why a lot of people who are um, who are quadriplegics, who are paralyzed from the way from the neck down have to be on ventilators because they cannot breathe on their own because they damage their phrenic nerve. Now, the thorax. Um, the thorax is the rib cage. You see right here, the sternum, that whole area right there. It has two really bitchin' purposes. The first one, of course, is structural. Um, it holds, kind of holds everything together. Uh, also, it protects the heart, the lungs, uh, the, all those organs in the mediastinum in that area right there. And as importantly, or even more importantly, it's our organ to allow us to breathe. So if your chest did not rise and fall, if you, if you, you, you couldn't expand and contract your chest, uh, you wouldn't be able to, to draw air into your lungs and breathe. So when I have someone who has an injury who has some kind of mechanism of injury that, that's telling me that their chest was struck or their upper back was struck or their rib cage was somehow involved, I immediately want to check a couple of things. First I want to do is I want to, of course, have somebody hold their, their neck and head in a spinal motion restriction position because if you think about it, the rib cage is attached posteriorly to the spine. And if you have someone punch you in the ribs, the energy travels through the rib cage and can actually affect your spinal column. So I'm going to think about maybe is their back hurt, is their neck hurt. I also want to make sure that the ribs aren't broken and I want to make sure that nothing's the, the, the lungs have not been punctured. So I'm going to have someone hold their neck and head in a neutral inline position from behind with the patient's permission obviously if they're awake and alert. And then I'm going to listen to their lung sounds pretty quickly. I'm going to take those, my, 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 my stethoscope. I'm going to listen to those, those, those six locations we, lo we learned about earlier. Uh, we're talking about the, the second, third intercostal space, fourth, fifth, or sixth, mid-axillary, and then subscapular. And I'm listening for equal air movement because what can happen sometimes when you have a damaged uh, rib cage or your clavicle's been broken or your scapula's been broken in an impact, the sharp bones of the ribs or the clavicle can actually push in and puncture your lung. And when your lung collapses, it's called a pneumothorax. And so you, you want to listen for that to make sure that they have equal lung sounds on both sides of their, of their thorax. You can also palpate, take your, put your hands gently on the rib cage and feel the rib cage, feel for soft spots or feel for tenderness. If you start pushing in, they go, ow, maybe you, they got some broken ribs, which is, a, which, is a, which is a serious indication that they've had a pretty good accident here. So I want to make sure that thorax is, it can move normally and healthfully, because otherwise they can't breathe effectively. I don't know if anyone out there has ever broken a rib before. I have. And when you break a rib, the last thing you ever want to do is take a deep breath, because it hurts so much. So you can only imagine this person's got a fractured rib, maybe two ribs, maybe three ribs. It's hard to breathe. Um, they take little short breaths because it's just so painful. This person needs oxygenation 
and rapid transport to a trauma center for evaluation. So the pelvis is our point of stabilization. It's where everything kind of comes together. You can see where the, uh, the spinal column comes down. And like I mentioned before, the sacrum actually is a fused portion that be becomes the posterior portion of your, your pelvic girdle. So you have the iliac crest, those iliac bones here. We have the ischial bones. Uh, at, they're kind of like the bicycle sits bones at the bottom. If you ever want to, if you're riding your bicycle, you're, you're sitting on your ischial bones. Um, our concern about the pelvis is uh, it's, it's, it's very vascular, meaning inside the pelvic girdle, you have large blood vessels, you have large arteries, large veins, you have the bladder, you have female reproductive organs in there. And if, if a person were to fall and shatter their pelvis, there could be lots of internal bleeding going on there and they could go into shock just by all that blood loss. I believe, and I've heard different numbers, but you could, you could probably lose up to about, about two liters of blood into your pelvis, uh, kind of gathers in there. So that's, you know, that's a third of your blood volume, which is, which is quite a bit of blood to lose. And we see this primarily with the elderly populations. Uh, elderly females, because they go through menopause and they, uh, they get what's called osteoporosis, their bones become very light and fragile. When they trip and fall over the chihuahua or they trip on the carpet or they fall in the shower and they land on their pelvis, they, they shatter their pelvis. And um, it, the same fall that you might, you might fall off your bicycle or fall down a flight of stairs or trip over somebody and land. It doesn't affect you in the slightest. You're a young and healthy person. You, you don't have osteoporosis, I'm assuming anyway. Uh, but this old person, that same mechanism that you, you, you bounce up and get off the ground, this woman's got a, a shattered pelvis now. And they can bleed internally. And like I mentioned uh, way back when, um, because of the fact that you have an elderly person who, who their heart function is is affected by aging process, their, their lung function is adversely affected by aging process, their blood vessels are affected, they don't have as good of a compensatory mechanism to help compensate for that blood loss. So they're more quickly affected by that blood loss and they, they can go into shock more easily and die more easily from blood loss than a younger, healthier person could. Going down to the lower extremities. The first bone we encounter uh, uh, is the femur. The femur is the largest bone of the body. It's the strongest bone of the body. So from the perspective of pre-hospital care, um, it's a hard bone to break. If someone has a shattered or broken femur, you have to automatically assume this person has been subjected to a high amount of energy. And the problem with femur fractures for us in the field is they're distracting injuries for us. I know that your, your book talks about how femur fractures are life-threatening injuries. Um, I would say yes, but they're not immediate life-threatening injuries in most cases. And the problem is, is they're very gross and obvious, especially with the bone sticking out through the thigh. And so we, we arrive on scene, this gentleman, car versus pedestrian, He's on the ground, he's holding his leg, he's crying out, hey, my leg, my leg, ow, my leg, my leg. He's crying, my leg hurts so much. And we're gonna go right for that leg and we're gonna treat that leg. Well, the problem is the leg's not gonna kill him. What's gonna kill him is the head injury, the spinal injury, the internal bleeding from his liver, from his spleen caused by the same impact. So that leg's kind of a secondary injury for us in most cases. We're gonna, we're gonna have somebody hold spinal motion restriction, have someone hold their head and neck in place. We're going to check out their head, their spine, their chest, their abdomen, their back. And once we get them stabilized on, on a spine board in the back of the ambulance, then we'll address the leg in route to the hospital. They got more serious internal problems than just that leg. Uh, but just Remember, it's it's uh, it's it's not a common call you go on. I probably go on a couple of year a couple of year. I've seen little kids with them. I've seen old people with them. Uh, just don't get distracted by them. Going down further down, you have the patella. That's the kneecap. Uh, the worst I see with these things is usually people crack them. They'll 
like fall onto their knees or they'll dislocate them laterally or medially. Um, and you'll get there and the knee will be slightly flexed and the, the kneecap will be over on one side or the other. It looks kind of weird, kind of, because well, it is kind of weird, I guess. Um, we, we try not to move the joint. We, we, we have, a, we have a, any kind of joint that's dislocated like that. We try to splint it exactly as we found it. Because if you go to straighten out that leg or reposition it, you can cause more nerve damage and blood vessel damage. So we try to splint it in whatever position we find it. Again, not life-threatening, but it takes a long time to heal. They'll be in a cast for quite a while if it's fractured especially. Going down a little lower, more distally here, uh, we're talking about the uh, tibia and fibula. The tibia is on the medial side. It's the big flat bone, the shin bone, I guess you can call it. Uh, the fibula is a little smaller, teenier bone that runs laterally. Uh, people do get uh, tib-fib fractures. It's a pretty common fracture. Uh, not life-threatening, but uh, again, it's a secondary injury when we, we might be treating. A person could, could fall from uh, a second-story building. They could shatter their tib-fib and uh, even crush their bone. But again, we're, we're dealing with the other more light, immediate life-threatening things that uh, we have to address. Uh, going a little further down, all the way down to the, 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 the feet, you have the, uh, the tarsals, the metatarsals, and phalanges. So you have the ankle bones, the foot bones, and the phalanges are your little toes. If someone damages their foot, it's not life-threatening, but it could be life-altering. I had a gentleman years ago that uh, was driving his car barefoot. He was going to go, he was surfing, he was heading down to PB, going to go surfing, as there were some tasty waves, I guess. And he got into a traffic accident, and he went to apply the brake uh, to st stop himself. And his foot slipped off the brake pedal up onto the bar that holds the brake pedal in place, and it split his foot in half. Literally, there was two toes on one side and three toes on the other, and his foot was like literally goofy foot, I guess, if any surfers out there know what I mean. And that's a life-altering injury. I mean, I, I, I don't think dancing for the stars is, is going to be uh, in, his, uh, in his future. So if someone loses his, their toes due to an injury or frostbite or someone has um, uh, fractured bones of their feet, they're hard to heal and they're usually very painful. So again, we want to treat them as a secondary injury, but we'll definitely splint them or stop the bleeding, whatever is necessary. So upper extremities, we have the humerus, which is the proximally that's attached to the, uh, the shoulder girdle right there, up there. Uh, this is not a very commonly fractured bone. It's a single bone, as you can kind of see. Uh, but if, if it is, usually from lateral impacts, uh, I've seen some car accidents where the driver gets T-boned and the door comes in and breaks their, uh, their humerus or maybe the passenger on the other side. It's a pretty rare bone to fracture, but it does happen. Moving down, well, more, uh, uh, more distally, you have the elbow joint, and then you'll see you have the radius and ulna. Now, the radial bone, it's really important that you notice that the radial bone is on the thumb side. There's, uh, there's two arteries that run along, down alongside our bones here on our forearm, and when we're taking a pulse on someone, usually we'll check the radial pulse, and the radial pulse is on the, radi the radius side. So if you... If you run your fingers down the pad of your thumb and you slide it onto the wrist and you, there's a little notch right there between the tendons and if you push down, you'll very gently, you'll feel your radial pulse. It's on the thumb side. There is, there is an ulnar pulse as well. It's deeper and smaller and it's really hard for us to find. But the radial pulse is very superficial. It's up closer to the skin and it's overlying a bone so we can push in gently and press in and feel the pulse. You only have to push in enough to feel the pulse. You don't have to push hard um, because if you push too hard, you'll actually occlude the pulse. So if you push in gently, you'll feel your radial pulse. People do fracture their, uh, their forearms. Uh, they get uh, collies fractures. I think they're called uh, um, silver fork fractures. Kids will put their hands out and they'll break their, their, uh, their bones. Again, we'll just splint them up, usually not life-threatening. The hand and the other hand, uh, you have the uh, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So you have the wrist bones, the fingers, and the tips of your fingers. 
Um, if someone does have a serious hand injury that is life altering, uh, I do a lot of woodworking at home. I build furniture for my house and I, I, my wife gives me all these projects to do. And I have a table saw. Ooh, go figure. Um, I go on every so often, every year or so, I'll go on someone who's done something wrong with their table saw and they're missing one or two of their fingers. Uh, if you were to, uh, you know, saw off three or four of your fingers, and even if you're able to reattach them at the hospital, it's still a life altering injury. So if you have someone who has multiple, has fingers amputated, it's really important to take them to the right hospital, a hospital that has an emergency reattachment team that can come on site and get that process done in a timely manner. Now, just to remind you again that your book considers a pelvic and femur fractures as life-threatening fractures, and I don't disagree entirely, uh, but just realize that, that these are both potentially high blood loss because of how vascular the femur as well as the pelvis is. They could go into shock. Uh, if they have a fractured pelvis, we can stabilize that pelvis. We learn more about that later on in the semester. If we have a fractured femur, we can splint and stabilize that to help reduce bleeding. So we can control this, but again, we're, we're going to treat, usually treat those two types of injuries en route to the hospital because more than likely they have more serious injuries, more immediate things going on that needs a physician to treat, a trauma surgeon to treat them. So let's talk about some of the uh, soft tissue. Uh, we have skeletal muscle, which is a voluntary muscle. It's very powerful, very strong, lots of blood supply. Uh, this is, you can walk and talk and chew, that kind of muscle. You have control over it. Uh, smooth muscle is involuntary muscle. And this is operated by the autonomic nervous system. So you have no control uh, of how this all works. Uh, this is found predominantly in your gastrointestinal tract your smooth muscle that allows food to be pushed through. It's called gut motility or peristaltic wave of pushing food through your gut and, and getting it out of your system and drawing off those nutrients we talked about earlier. We also have smooth muscle in our arteries and veins. It's the middle layer of each artery and vein and it, it can contract and expand the size of that artery or vein to increase or decrease your blood pressure and to uh, decrease or increase the flow of blood to a certain area of your body. So when, as an EMT, we, we think a lot about vasodilation versus vasoconstriction, the act of these muscles contracting and relaxing based on your body's uh, condition and pos even position of your body. Uh, cardiac muscle is a muscle unto itself. It, it's, it has what's called automaticity which means it can self-excite. Even though the heart is controlled uh, by our autonomic nervous system indirectly through uh, the vagus nerve and the release of adrenaline, do, do you, your heart rate is controlled by those external forces. But if you didn't have those two forces uh, applying to the heart, the heart can actually contract on its own without any, any outside uh, stimuli. So this is that contractility and automaticity. Each little cardiac cell in your heart has its own ability to contract. It has its own ability with automaticity. So if one portion of the heart is damaged, another portion will take over that same heartbeat, though not as efficiently or effectively. Uh, ligaments are bone to bone. They're the, the kind of a sinewy, fibrous uh, structure that holds the, your bone, your joints together. It's kind of the hinges that allow your your uh, your uh, your joints to move. I know people do tear ligaments. Uh, they stretch them. They're hard to repair. Whether it's by just rehab or surgery, they're hard to bring them back to normal. Unfortunately, due to the lack of their lack of blood supply to those those structures. Uh, tendons are uh, bone to muscle. This, so the muscle turns into a tendon. A tendon attaches to a bone as an anchor point. So when you do you contract your muscle, these two points. The muscle gets shorter and you flex your muscles. Uh, people do tear the tendons out of their muscles or tear their tendons. Uh, very hard to heal as well. Uh, sometimes requires surgical repair. 
Uh, people get uh, hamstrings. That's kind of the same idea. Now, respiratory anatomy. Um, if you just think about your respiratory anatomy as a series of, of tubes that start out big and then gradually over the distance get smaller and smaller and all, also all the way down to a microscopic level. So your nose and mouth, your nose is called the nasopharynx. You should know that term, nasopharynx. Um, the mouth is called the oropharynx. Uh, and air enters through the oral and nasopharynx. It goes to the back of the throat, which can be called the, 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 the laryngopharynx, the back of the throat, back where your, your tongue kind of starts at. And it meets back there, the nose and the mouth meet back there essentially. And then the air goes in down into your, tr your trachea. Your trachea is uh, the anterior portion. If you look at someone sideways, especially a male, you'll see they have the Adam's apple, that thing bulging out. That's your larynx. And that's your, the start of your trachea right there. Trachea is held open by uh, rings of cartilage. Um, it's kind of C-shaped rings of cartilage. It's held open because if it were to collapse, you wouldn't be able to breathe. Air goes down through the, the larynx, down through the trachea, and it goes to the main stem bronchial tubes. There's a right and a left main stem bronchi. And then they keep splitting off into smaller and smaller and smaller tubes. The bronchi eventually become bronchioles, uh, and then finally alveoli. And the alveoli are at the very microscopic level. These are little microscopic sacs that air uh, accumulate in. And these are one cell thick structures. And what's wrapped right around these structures are arteries, little tiny, they're called what's called microcirculation, little capillary microcirculation. And this is where the gas exchange occurs. So the only place in your lungs that gas can exchange, and the two gases I'm talking about is carbon dioxide, which is a waste product that we, we breathe out, and oxygen, which comes in and we use as energy source. The only place in your lungs that can exchange those two gases is at, in the alveolar area there. So air has to get all the way down to those alveolar sacs, and you have to have enough blood returning back to those little capillaries they have to meet up at the right amount of pressure on both sides to allow those two gases to exchange. So if you're not breathing effectively enough to shallow or not breathing at all, and then no, no air is getting into those alveolar sacs, you're not going to get a gas exchange. If you're breathing fine, but not enough blood's returning back to the capillaries because you're losing blood from, from an injury, you're not going to get good gas exchange at that alveolar level. So there's a lot of factors involved in this. Uh, you should be aware of the, uh, the path of, of, of air from the outside all the way down to the alveoli. It's listed here, the nose and mouth, the pharynx, the back of the throat, the trachea, the bronchial tubes, and then the alveoli. That's the, that's the steps starting the outside to inside. Now, just briefly talk about the lungs. You'll notice that uh, on the lungs, uh, the right side has three lobes and the left side have two lobes. There's a little notch in the area of the mediastinum that gives it there's really there's room there for the heart essentially. Um, the lungs, if you were to remove a lung and slice it up, it's not a sack of air. It's not it's not a balloon. It looks more like a very like a spongy structure inside. And those are the millions and millions and millions and millions of bronchial airway passages. And those little tiny passages, they actually have muscles in them as well. And they're smooth muscle, so they're involuntary muscle. Um, and people do bronchodilate and bronchoconstrict. Um, people take bronchodilators, uh, beta-2, like, uh, um, like uh, uh, albuterol sulfate, which is a common uh, rescue inhaler for asthmatics and people who have other respiratory diseases and, and issues. And if they inhale this Bronco 2 specific inhaler, it, it relaxes those muscles, those smooth muscles in your lungs and it bronchodilates. Uh, people who have allergic reactions uh, and asthma attack or other types of uh, respiratory problems, they can get bronchoconstriction and bronchoconstriction makes your bronchial airway patches just smaller and you're less able to 
breathe effectively when you have these super narrowed passages. Two more things I want to point out here is in the upper uh, right corner there is, is the uh, parietal and visceral pleura. Now the visceral pleura is a membrane that lines the lung tissue itself and the parietal pleura lines the wall of the thorax on the inside and these two structures touch each other and they're held in place by surface tension by negative pressure and there's a there's a there's a liquid in there that uh, that allows it's like a, like a lubricant that allows these two structures to slide over one another it's like having a taking two pieces of saran wrap and putting some oil, like some vegetable oil, between the two layers, and these two layers of saran wrap are gonna to stick together. And the purpose behind this is, is when your, your rib cage starts to expand, as you take a breath in, and your muscles contract, and your rib cage starts to stretch out, because these two organs are, are, are adhered to one another, sort of, it draws your, your lung tissue out with it, and it expands your lungs, allowing air to rush in to fill your lungs. If the parietal and visceral pleuras are somehow damaged, this, this seal is lost. And what can happen is air can fill that void in that, in that, in, in that, in that pleura space. And your lung, the one the side that's affected, will collapse because it can no longer attach to the wall of the thorax. This can be caused by penetrating trauma to the chest, a gunshot wound or a stabbing, or it can even be caused by something internal like a broken rib, uh, and there's no external puncture mark. Basically, this person broke his rib, the sharp edge of the rib came in, it punctured the pleura, the actual one side of this, these structures, and air is now seeping into that, 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 that pleural space, and the lung is starting to collapse. So again, anyone, anyone, someone has any kind of thoracic trauma, they got punched in the chest, they got a steering wheel into the chest, they fell off their horse and landed on their chest. And again, this is the, the upper back as well as the front. Uh, I want to listen to those lung sounds and make sure that we don't have a, a lung that's starting to collapse, starting to fall away from the wall of the thorax. So the lungs, some, the, the lungs themselves have receptors inside them uh, to, to respond to various circumstances. One, the, the J receptors, uh, they respond to states of hypoxia. Remember what we talked about earlier, hypoxia is the state of low oxygen in the tissues. And dyspnea is a sensation of shortness of breath. It's a subjective feeling the patient's going to complain of. If someone says, I can't catch my breath, uh, that person has a dyspnea. Um, stretch receptors, it's exactly what it sounds like. They help to limit the amount that the lungs can stretch so that they don't damage themselves. And we have what's called irritant receptors inside the lungs as well. Um, Everyone has these little tiny microscopic hairs lining your trachea and your upper bronchial tubes. They also, there's also mucous membranes that, that secrete mucus to help lubricate. And what these, these two structures do is when we breathe in every day, we breathe in bacteria and viruses and dust particles and all the different other types of minute uh, irritants. And when they get into our airway passages, the between the hairs and the mucus, they, they trap these irritants uh, and they push them back up out. And that's why you have to cough and sneeze. This stuff comes back up again, slowly but surely, and you cough them out. And this is a really great thing because it prevents bacteria and viruses getting into our lungs. So it helps to minimize our chance of getting sick. Now, people who smoke get things like emphysema and because they're smoking over a period of years and years and years, they, they destroy those two mechanisms. They destroy their cilia and their mucous membranes get destroyed as well due to the smoking. So they don't have this irritant or cough reflex. So ultimately, ultimately what happens to these people is they breathe in these bacteria and these viruses and they get them into their lungs and they get, they get infections. And that's why a lot of people with, it's called COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, people with this condition, uh, they're very prone to 
pneumonia, bronchial infections, things like that. So don't be surprised you're going to run on these people and they're going to have these various types of infections. Now, if you look at the uh, couple terms here, if you ever see a, free, uh, um, a, 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 a prefix tacky, tacky always means faster than normal. Uh, Brady is slower. So someone who's tachypnic is breathing faster than what is normal for them. Now remember, children can breathe at 30 breaths per minute and that's normal for them because that's, that's their age group. But an adult, 30 is way too fast. So this is, this is relative to, to the person, to their age. Um, so an adult average, usually 12 to 24 range is probably about, about average for most adults. But infants and children, like you've already learned, they can breathe at 30, 25, 30 times a minute. So anything that's above normal would be to, being to, to Kipnik. And just the opposite, if, if they're breathing too slow, below their normal rate, and it's ineffective, especially uh, not breathing effectively enough to maintain life anyway, then this would be a Brady uh, rate, so below normal rate. So when it comes to anatomical differences of pediatrics versus adult, there are some structural differences we have to be aware of because when we're treating children, uh, young children and infants versus adults, uh, we can't use that typical head tilt chin lift uh, type of maneuver you learned in your CPR class. We have to be more careful with the child or infant's airway because it's much more fragile the structures are a lot less developed. Uh, so we'll go through this. So on little kids, infants, and uh, young children, the head is proportionally much larger than the, than the torso. And the back of the head, the, the, the occipital area of the head, when, it's, when the patient, the child, is flat on their back, like you see in this picture right here, the head is much larger, so it forces the chin down towards their chest. It kind of bends their neck downward. And if this is on an infant or young child, this can actually partially occlude their trachea, their breathing tube. So when we're opening an unconscious or unresponsive child's airway, we do not do the, the, the normal head tilt chin lift that we would perform on an adult. We do something more of a jaw thrust type maneuver where we're going to maintain the child's head in a neutral position and we're going to uh, cause their jaw to... Uh, displace forward or anteriorly to move the tongue away from the back of the throat. We call this the uh, the sniffing position. Uh, the head is neutral. If you want to get a point of reference, when a child's head's positioned properly, their nose is pointing straight up towards the ceiling. And for us to accomplish this, one of the best ways to do this is if you're going to if you're going to place a child on their back, like you see in this picture right here, uh, get a towel or a blanket or a sheet and you're gonna put it under the child's torso and that raises up the torso and brings it up to the level of the child's, the back of the child's head and that will automatically place the child in that neutral sniffing position. Then we'll, we'll grasp the child's jaw and then we'll displace it interiorly using our fingers like you, I know you learned in your CPR class. So again, the, we're concerned about how fragile, how how underdeveloped their airway is, especially the trachea. I believe that uh, when you're born, a newborn, the uh, inside of the trachea is about four millimeters in diameter, and it's very, very uh, undersupported, very, very underdeveloped, so it can easily be kinked by overextending, over flexing the person's neck and head when you're trying to open the airway. Inside the mouth, you have a very small mouth, and you have really big tongue and a really big epiglottis. The, the tongue is much larger proportionally than it is on an adult. And the epiglottis, remember the epiglottis is that flap that covers the trachea. It's on the back side, it's attached indirectly by a ligament to the tongue. And when you go to swallow something, a liquid or a solid, this flap comes down, covers the top of the trachea, the, the air tube, and allows that food product to slide over the top of that and goes into your esophagus and then into your stomach. If the epiglottis does not cover the trachea, 
then the food might go into your lungs causing aspiration and people die from this. So the epiglottis is much larger on a kid and the tongue is much, much larger proportionally. And so if a child has some type of uh, infection of the epiglottis, the epiglottis can swell, it can double and triple in size. And you can only imagine it would partially or completely cover the trachea. If the child's having an allergic reaction from a bee sting or from peanut ingestion or something like that, the tongue can double in size and cause an airway obstruction as well. So again, we're, we're extra concerned about this in kids uh, because of the disproportionate size of the mouth versus the structures inside the mouth. Okay, so let's talk about ventilation. The term ventilation means to move air in and out of your lungs. Now, the ambient air here at sea level here in San Diego uh, is 14 pounds per square inch atmospheric pressure. So for us to get air in, into our lungs, we have to change the, the amount of pressure inside our lungs. And the way our body does this is when we, when we flex our intercostal muscles and when we flex our diaphragm, um, then what happens is your rib cage expands, like we talked about before, drawing out your lung tissue and it expands your lungs. And when you expand a container of gas, you lower the pressure. So the pressure inside your lungs lowers below 14 pounds per square inch atmospheric pressure and air rushes in your mouth, your nose, your trachea, into your lungs to fill the void. That's inhalation. Now, that's an active process. It takes energy to do that. Anytime you contract a muscle or you flex a muscle, it takes energy. So that's done. You've inhaled the air. And now what happens is, is you exhale and your body relaxes the intercostal muscles. It relaxes the diaphragm. It causes your, uh, your rib cage to contract. It increases the pressure inside your lungs above 14 pounds per square inch. And the excess air that you don't need is exhaled out through your nose and mouth. Um, it's all about just volume and, and pressures. Uh, anyone ever done any hiking up in the mountains and they're 10 or 12,000 feet, 13,000 feet, and they wonder why it's so hard to breathe, uh, harder to breathe than normal, uh, at sea level anyway, um, it's because there's less atmospheric pressure that high up and you have to take a deeper breath to get the same amount of volume in. So the term respiration means the exchange of gases at a cellular level. So this is uh, this is once the gas is, we're talking about again, carbon dioxide, which is a waste product that's produced by your cells that you, you breathe out and the oxygen that you breathe in, which is a source of energy. And so these two gases have to exchange and that exchange of gases is considered respiration. Now, where this occurs first is it occurs in the alveoli of the lungs, little tiny grape-like sacs at the very distal end of your bronchial tubes. There's millions and millions of them, and they're one cell thick structures. As you can see from this picture, wrapped around them are those capillaries, they're called microcirculation, and the gases exchange. And it's really important that you have the right amount of pressure on both sides of these membranes for the gas to exchange uh, properly. Um, if you have a mismatched uh, pressure differential between these two structures, you're not going to get the carbon dioxide off gassing and get breathed out, and you're not going to get the oxygen uploaded onto your blood to feed your body. So if someone's having an asthma attack and they can't take a breath in, a sufficient breath in anyway, to get enough pressure down into the alveoli, they're not going to be able to exchange gases, so they're going to become hypoxic because they can't pick up any oxygen to feed their body, and then they can't get rid of their excess carbon dioxide, so their body's going to, be, going to become very, very acid. Uh, carbon dioxide is a very acidic product. 
and it makes your body acidotic and uh, it drops your pH levels below their normal range and the body doesn't function very well in these acidotic states. So when someone's breathing inadequately, even though there's plenty of blood returning to the capillaries surrounding these alveolar sacs, there's not enough exchange of gas because there's not enough air getting into the into the uh, into those alveolar sacs. Now, conversely, you could have a person who's breathing just fine. They have great movement of air into their lungs. They have great volume of air into their lungs, but because of them being shot or stabbed or or in some kind of traumatic injury, they've lost a lot of blood. And if they have less blood or blood pressure, less blood is getting to the capillaries surrounding these structures. So even though you get plenty of oxygen coming in to the alveoli, it can't exchange to the bloodstream because of this mismatched uh, uh, pressure differential. So this person's obviously got a big problem as well. So once the gases are exchanged at the alveolar level, the carbon dioxide, the waste product has been exhaled through your lungs and the oxygen has been picked up by the bloodstream and it's carried back to, to the heart and pumped out into their arterial system and pumped out to your target organs. Once it gets to the target organs, uh, the gas exchange is reversed. Carbon dioxide is picked up by the bloodstream to be sent back to the heart and lungs to be removed from the body. And oxygen is dropped off at the cells as a form of energy. Now you can see, just like with the previous slide, if a person has low blood pressure or low levels of oxygen, for whatever reason, this process isn't going to work very well. And this is a problem with lack of perfusion to the organs. And what happens is if the organs can't exchange gases, if these cells can't exchange gases, then the cells don't have any energy to function and the carbon dioxide builds up because they can't get rid of the carbon dioxide and the cells eventually die if this perfusion or this lack of perfusion remains long enough. Now, when it comes to signs and symptoms of adequate breathing, normal healthy breathing is effortless, it's unlabored. Um, ultimately, right now, as you're getting bored with this lecture, you're sitting there, I would imagine you're breathing, but until we're, we started talking about this, you probably weren't even aware of the fact that you were breathing. Uh, it's controlled by your autonomic nervous system and your body changes your rate and depth of breathing depending on the circumstances of your, of your needs. You do without any conscious thought. Uh, you can consciously take a deep breath. You can control your own breath, but when you're not thinking about it, your body takes over. Uh, this is good, healthy, normal breathing. Now, when someone has some type of respiratory infection, they're having an asthma attack, they have some kind of trauma to their chest, uh, they have some fluid loss or blood loss. There's dozens and dozens of reasons why people can have inadequate breathing. We need to look for these signs and symptoms. Some of them are very subtle and some are very, very obvious. I'll go through these for you. So let's talk about inadequate breathing. Now, as EMTs, when we arrive at scene of some type of uh, emergency, our patient assessment is going to start when we first see the patient. Now, you see this picture right here. This gentleman is in what's called the tripod position. It's a natural position that people go into when they're short of breath. I know some of you might be athletes. You might have done some type of wind sprint or, or a 50-yard dash or interval uh, training, and more than likely, when you're done with that interval, that short sprint, you probably had this instinct to want to lean forward and place your hands on your knees. Again, this is a natural response to uh, being short of breath. But unlike you, young healthy athlete, this person's having some kind of medical problem that's not going to get resolved uh, like you know your issue was. 
We talked about breathing too fast and breathing too slow, Tacky versus Brady. Uh, and we know that if you breathe way too fast or way too slow, in both cases, you're going to have in, inefficient air volume entering your lungs and you're going you're to have very inadequate exchange of gases. Uh, cyanosis is uh, a late sign of hypoxia. So remember, hypoxia is uh, low oxygen levels in the tissues. The word cyan, cyanosis is broken down. Cyan is a color of blue. Osis is an abnormal condition. So cyanosis is an abnormal blue color. And normally your skin is, is pink. And the reason why it's pink is because our blood is oxygenated. But if you're low on oxygen, it turns a darker purple color. And when the ambient light in the room or the ambient light outside in the sun strikes your skin, it's, it actually turns the skin a bluish color, and that's cyanosis. So cyanosis means this person's grossly hypoxic. You see this primarily in the lips, the nail beds, uh, under the eyelids, anywhere that you can see pink. Uh, remember, no matter what color you possibly you might be, we're all pink inside. So if you look inside someone's mouth, their tongue, their, the inside of their lips, uh, under their eyelids, their nail beds, the palms of their hands, the soles of their feet. Um, those are all areas that are pink and you'll be able to then see the cyanosis when the color change happens. Uh, cool clammy skins, when your body perceives that this person is having problems breathing, it sends messages to the central nervous system, to the brainstem, and the brainstem tries to keep the person alive by increasing the respiratory rate, their effort, uh, the amount of muscles that they use to breathe, they, they, they add in more accessory muscles to breathe harder and faster to try to maintain some type of fairly normal oxygenation. But in doing this, it releases adrenaline. And like I mentioned before, with the fight and flight syndrome, adrenaline has some effects and has some side effects. It increases your heart rate, which is in this case probably a pretty good idea. Uh, it, it increases your blood pressure, which is a great idea. But what it also does is it shunts blood. It squeezes your capillaries in your skin. It's because it's vasoconstriction. It makes your, your veins and arteries smaller. And it, it pushes the blood from your skin, which is a non-vital organ, to the vital organs, which is the brain, the liver, the spleen, and the heart, to keep you alive during these extreme conditions. It also uh, releases uh, sweat as well. So if you think about it, if you drain the blood from your skin due to this vasoconstriction properties and this shunting of blood away from the or towards the vital organs, your skins are going to become cool and pale. So pale, cool, and because adrenaline is released, it causes you to sweat. So pale, cool, and clammy. So if you walk in the door and see someone in this tripod position and their skins are pale, cool, and clammy, you know this guy's pretty pretty serious, you know, the off essentially. Um, if this person does have some type of respiratory problem going on, they have asthma or bronchitis or pneumonia or some kind of problem with their emphysema, whatever it might be, the bronchial tubes inside your lungs have smooth muscle so they can bronchoconstrict and bronchodilate. And because of this person's disease, it causes bronchoconstriction, makes the, the uh, bronchial tubes even smaller than normal. And the lining of the bronchial tubes has mucous membranes, which secretes mucus. So if you have a person having an asthma attack, the asthma attack causes, causes the bronchial tubes to constrict, to get smaller, and to hypersecrete this mucus. The combination of these two things decreases the amount of air getting down to the alveoli because it makes everything tighter and it causes more resistance to get air into your uh, to your lungs. So the only way that your body can overcome this increased resistance inside your your lungs is to make you breathe harder and faster. The problem with this is is to breathe harder and faster and use these accessory muscles to do so uh, takes energy and the two things that, that provide our cells energy, our muscles energy, is oxygen and glucose. Well, glucose is probably okay, but what's he low on? He's low on oxygen. 
So he's already low in oxygen due to his respiratory difficulty. He's working really hard to breathe, which is using up a lot of his energy. And pretty soon, like a, a runner, pretty soon they're going to fatigue, their muscles are going to fatigue, and they're going to fail. And when their muscles, when his muscles, when his breathing muscles fail, he will stop breathing. His chest will stop moving. And within a couple minutes after that, his heart will stop and he'll die. So when someone is showing signs of, of accessory muscle use and they have labored respirations, labored respirations just means that they're just working hard to breathe. These patients need aggressive, quick treatment, whatever that might be. It could be bag valve mass ventilations. It could be an oxygen mask. It could be assist, uh, uh, helping them with their medications. Whatever it might be, they need that intervention to keep them alive, to keep them alive until they get to the hospital where doctors can intervene with more advanced care. So let's talk about the circulatory system. Um, the circulatory system is a closed system. It's made up of three major uh, organs. One is the heart, which is the pump. The blood vessels, the arteries and veins and capillaries make up the container. And the blood volume in that container is what circulates the oxygen and the carbon dioxide and other products. If any one of these three components are affected adversely, it affects the other two. I'll give you a quick for instance. So uh, if you're having a heart attack and you've damaged your heart muscles to the point the pump cannot pump any longer, even though your blood volume has not changed and even though your blood vessels haven't been damaged because you can't pump enough blood around quickly enough, you've dropped your blood pressure, you cannot circulate blood effectively, you can't exchange gases, and your perfusion is, 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 is affected. If on the other hand, if your heart's just fine, but let's say you have allergies to peanuts and you inadvertently eat a peanut butter sandwich and you go into anaphylactic shock, which is a form of allergic reaction, and one of the effects of that is, is massive vasodilation. So all your arteries and veins just get really big. They dilate out. And when all these arteries and veins dilate out, blood pools and the pump, the heart, doesn't have enough pump, basically, to fill those voids so your blood pressure drops and now you're in anaphylactic shock. Let's say your heart's just fine and let's say your uh, blood vessels are fine except you have a, someone stabbed you and you have a small nick in one of your arteries and you're squirting blood from that artery. Well, the pump's trying to pump, you're losing volume, but as you're losing volume, it's harder and harder for the heart to pump effectively. And so you're, you're even though all of, pretty much all of your blood vessels are intact, with, that, with the exception of the one little nick, little nick in your artery, um, it can't keep up. It just, you're just pumping that fluid out. And as that fluid gets lost, your blood pressure drops and the ability for the body to circulate uh, is lost. I'm getting tired here. I gotta go home here soon. I like to get this done, you know. Fuck me, Dad. Really starting to annoy me now. Well, that's because of the size of the, uh, the size of the file or something. It's only 50, it's 50 slides. It's not any bigger than the other one I did. Let's talk about the anatomy of the heart first. So the heart essentially is two separate pumps that are stuck together. Um, it's about the size of your fist. It's, it's, it's located about just slightly left center of your, under your sternum and your chest. And it pumps your entire blood volume every minute of your life. It's a very efficient pump. Uh, it has two sides, like I said, it has two pumps. And if you think about this as two separate pumps that just happen to be hanging out together, 
maybe it will help you better understand the, uh, how this whole thing works. So the right side of the heart, remember this is the patient's right, the right side of the heart is the low pressure side, and the left side of the heart is the high pressure side. And you can see from the, the diagram here, uh, you'll notice that just the drawing, the gray area is this, the cutaway part of the muscle. You'll notice that the muscle on the left side is about twice as thick as the muscle on the right side. And this is actually pretty indicative of what is in someone's heart because you think about it, the right side only pumps to the lungs. It doesn't have very far to go. It doesn't have to have very much pressure to get there. The left side goes to the entire body. It needs a lot of pressure to punch, pump that blood out to everywhere, your fingertips, your toes, everywhere. So you can see the path of a blood flow through the body. Um, the blood drops off its uh, oxygen at the cells. It picks up carbon dioxide. This blood now becomes deoxygenated venous blood. That deoxygenated venous blood returns to the heart through the vena cavus, the superior and inferior vena cavus, goes into the chamber one right there, which is the right atria, goes through the tricuspid valve into number two there, which is the uh, right ventricle. The lower chambers are ventricles, the upper chambers are atria. Uh, it gets pumped out of the ventricle through the pulmonic valve out to the pulmonary artery, and that takes it to the lungs where it gets into the lungs, it exchanges gases at that alveolar level like we talked about earlier. It gets pumped around. Now, it, now it's reoxygenated and the carbon dioxide has been removed to some extent. It goes back to the left side of the heart uh, via the pulmonary vein. It goes into the left side, number three right there, which is the, the, the left atria. It goes through the mitral valve. It goes down into the left ventricle. It's pumped out when the heart contracts through the aortic valve, out to the aortic arch, and out to the body. And now it's arterial blood that's oxygenated. Now there's, there's a fairly common condition we encounter, uh, which you should really know about, read up on carefully, and that's called congestive heart failure. There's two types. Uh, one is called right-sided heart failure, and one is called left-sided heart failure. Uh, right-sided heart failure is a chronic condition that people live with. Um, the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, fails. It's, it's usually most commonly caused by some kind of heart attack. And because the right side can't pump, the, as the blood's coming into the right side of the heart from the body, it can't keep up with the volume. So that blood, that excess blood that the heart can't control, gets pushed back out. That's why they call this congestive heart failure, because it congests that blood back out into the body, back out into the venous system. When your veins overstretch and they get overfilled with blood, uh, your body wants to get rid of that excess fluid. Now, your blood is made up of four basic components. Uh, one of them is plasma. Plasma is the liquid that everything's suspended in. It's basically, it's, you can call it water if you want. And so what the body does, it allows this water to, to drain out through the wall of the vein. And this now this is called edema. And the edema is the liquid that's in the tissues surrounding these, these veins. Well, this, this edema, it's just, just basically water, or, and it, it, it goes down to gravity, so it flows down. So people who, who are sitting and standing over time, what happens is this water pools in their ankles, because that's kind of the bottom of the, of, the, of the body, and they get what's called pitting edema. They get swollen ankles, uh, and that's a sign of possible congestive heart failure on the right side. And because the veins are distended, we have these two veins, the very ex these external jugular veins in our neck. They run from about the jawline to the clavicles, and normally you don't see them, unless you're like lying flat or lifting weights or something. You don't see them pop out, but these people with congestive heart failure, the, their 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 veins in their neck are always kind of bulging a little bit, and that's again it's another sign of right-sided heart failure. So you have pitting edema to the ankles and jugular vein distension are two of the most common signs of potentially this person having uh, right-sided congestive heart failure. Now, if you have right-sided heart failure, it's a chronic long-term condition. And what it does, unfortunately, do is it puts a stress eventually on the left side. 
And over a period of years and years and years and years of this happening, it can actually wear out the left side of the heart. So now the left ventricle is weak. And so if the, left, if the left ventricle cannot pump effectively, this can also happen because of a heart attack as well, but most commonly you see it from people who have right-sided heart failure. But if, if the left side, of the, if the, if the, if the left, left, left ventricle starts to fail, just, re just remember that the, the blood that's coming back from the lungs goes into the left ventricle. If the left ventricle cannot pump effectively, then that excess blood coming in to the heart has to go somewhere. And the only place it can go is back out into the lungs. Now, all that excess blood pressurizes the blood vessels in the lungs, and the body wants to do the exact same thing, wants to get rid of that pressure, so it allows the plasma to leak out of the blood vessels in the lungs, and now you have water in your lungs. So you literally are drowning in your own fluids. And these people, it's a fairly rapid onset. A left side. Now, when it comes to the heart, the heart in itself is a muscle. Remember, it's cardiac muscle. So it has some uh, properties that no other muscle in the body has. It has what's called automaticity. It can, it can beat on its own. It doesn't need any outside stimuli. Uh, and it has contractility. The heart muscle, the cells, uh, can contract. There's two types of cells in the heart. There's contractile cells, and then there's nodal cells. The nodal cells are the ones that uh, provide the, the source of the, of the beat, but the, the uh, cardiac cells, the contractile cells, are the ones that actually contract, creating the, the squeeze, which pushes the blood out of the heart. So the heart's a muscle itself, and all muscles need oxygen and glucose to function. And where the heart gets its blood from are the coronary arteries, those two, those red things you see there that are on the surface of the heart there. The blue is, of course, the venous, the, re, the, the blood returning. Uh, where the coronary arteries get its blood from, or their blood from, is the coronary sinuses. And if you see that pink tube standing up right there, uh, that's the, the uh, that's the base of the of the aorta or the aortic arch, and inside, if you were to look down that hole right there, you'd see the uh, the aortic valve, and it's got little flaps on it. And when the left ventricle contracts, that blood rushes up that tube, and it opens up those valve or those valve leaves, and it allows blood to pump out to the body. Well, between contractions, those flaps fold back down again, flat, and it exposes the coronary sinuses. So your heart gets blood to be used as a source of energy for the muscle only when your left ventricle is at rest. So if you were to take your two fingers and you place them on your radial pulse, and every time you feel a thump, every time you feel a beat, that's your left ventricle contracting. Between each thump, each beat, is when your heart is getting blood supplied to the muscle. Now, why I bring this up? Well, think about it. Let's say you have, you're one of those people who decide to use methamphetamines. And let's say you do uh, crack cocaine or something exciting like that. Well... Those amphetamine-like products increase your heart rate. Uh, I've, I've encountered patients with heart rates of 200, 220, 240, and even 260 beats per minute uh, who are on amphetamine products. Well, if you think about it, if the heart only gets fed oxygen to its muscles when it's at rest, if your heart rate's going 200 beats a minute, is it ever at rest? So... I, I, I fairly routinely encounter uh, men in their tw late 20s, early 30s, may maybe early 40s. They're having heart attacks. And once I get them stabilized, once I treat them, I always ask them the same question. Is So when you were younger, did you use any type of amphetamine products? And almost to a person, when I have a, when I have a, when I have a guy who's got a heart attack at 35, I'm almost guaranteed in high school they did something exciting. And what happened is because they were on this 
this drug and their heart was at such high rate for so long and it was being denied oxygen for so long. Because remember, because they're beating so fast, they're actually denying their heart muscle oxygen. And it causes permanent damage to their heart. Now, it doesn't hurt them immediately, but years later, their heart is now, it's, they have this modeling, essentially, have, has happened, their heart muscle, and it makes them more prone to heart attacks in their, you know, 30s and 40s. So I'm concerned about these really high heart rates because you're, you're pumping at 200, 220, 230 for an extended period of time, the heart's going to get damaged. Now, I was an athlete. I, I raced bicycles for many years, and I, I can swear that I, I, I got my heart rate up to about 220, but only for maybe a minute, you know, or two minutes during a sprint. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about this person who's who has this, 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 this sustained heart rate going on for hours and hours and even days sometimes. I had one gentleman, he was he was smoking crack for four days in a row, nonstop, 24 hours a day for four days. His heart rate was above 200 for four days. So during that period of time, you know he damaged his heart. So I'm concerned about, it's, it's called a ventricular fill time. So the faster that heart pumps, the less blood that can get into the ventricle, so less blood can get out. And less blood can get into the muscles of the heart through the coronary arteries, so less oxygen is getting to the, to the heart muscle itself. So just like your house or your car, your heart has an electrical conduction system. There's a series of wires, and it has a source of uh, electrical message. And these are those nodal cells I was talking about. The group of nodal cells that are, has the strongest, most powerful message is called the sinoatrial node. You'll hear it described as the pacemaker of the heart. On average, an adult's heart beats between 60 and 80 beats per minute. That's about, about one every second, one pulse every second. And this, this pulse message leaves the sinoatrial node it travels through what's called the internodal pathways, which are these fine little wires that, that cover the lining of the atria. Remember, we want the atria to contract in a rhythmic pattern, and we want that atria to contract from the top down. So we want to squeeze the blood that's in the atria downward towards the center of the heart, towards the ventricles. So this starts high up on the base of the heart, top of the heart, and it squeezes down towards the, the center of the heart. Once that's completed, this message, the same message, wraps around and it winds up at the atrioventricular node. And the atrioventricular node is, is a group of nodal cells. They're non-contractile. And they pick up this message. And the AV node does two really cool things. One, it only allows a single message to get through at a time to maintain some, some kind of continuity here, because you can only imagine if 20 messages got through at the same time, your heart wouldn't function. And it also delays that impulse. So it, we want the atria to contract a, a millisecond before the ventricles. And this would this what really makes our heart so effective as a pump is because we have the atria contract, and then there's a pause, and then the ventricles contract. If we didn't have that pause, we wouldn't have a very efficient uh, system. Once the uh, AV node does its job, the message passes through there, it goes down through the AV bundle, it goes into the bundle branches, it goes all the way to the base of the heart, I'm sorry, the apex of the heart, which is, which is at the bottom of the heart, and it comes back up again as these Purkinje fibers. You'll notice how the message goes all the way to the bottom, all the way to the apex of the heart, and then back up. Again, we want that contraction to start at the bottom of the heart and work up towards the center of the heart because we want to squeeze that blood out of the ventricles and out to wherever it's going, whether it's the body or the lungs. So you can see how this is the normal healthy pathway. Now, that being said, if you look at these rhythm strips I have on here on the slide, the upper strip is a fairly normal conduction of a person's heart. You'll notice the big tall spikes, they're very narrow, they're fairly regular, and 
all that a, that a an EKG rhythm strip is is measuring or recording uh, is the electrical impulses of the heart. It doesn't tell you whether the heart's beating, actually pumping. It's telling you that there's these electrical impulses. So if you were to look at this rhythm strip and see those tall spikes, each one of those tall spikes should correspond to a beat that you can feel when you feel their pulse. So if you, if you see the spike and you feel the beat, then you have electrical conduction as well as mechanical conduction of the heart. But let's say this person's having a heart attack, and heart attacks can lead to uh, tissue of the heart, muscle of the heart dying. It can also lead to damage to the wiring system. It's just just like if a if a if a rat got into your car and, and ate your wiring harness of your car, you'd have some problems. Or if you drilled into the wall of your house and inadvertently drilled into a wire in your house, you'd have a short. So it causes a short, a short in your heart somewhere. So now the, the, the sinoelectro node fires off. It sends off a message. It goes down through this wiring system, but there's a blockage. So rather than coming to a dead stop, that message continues, and it kind of continues kind of in a roundabout way, and it, it slows down this message. So you notice the, the, middle, uh, the middle one in red there, the middle rhythm strip. You'll notice that the spikes that correspond with the pulse are wider now, and, and the whole rhythm is slower. And this is this is because everything's slowed down because there's a there's a blockage somewhere in the heart that's slowing down the conduction of the heart, and this is why as a paramedic I'll put people on EKGs and I can interpret what's going on in their heart, their conduction system to see if there's any blockages anywhere in that conduction system which might make me think this might person might be having a heart attack. Now finally at the bottom one this person's having a really bad time, that's the very last beat of their life. They have this one last gasping heart conduction beat. Whether or not it actually created a beat, who knows. But that's one little blast spike of, uh, of activity, and now they've gone into asystole, which is that flat line, and their heart has no more electrical conduction or activity whatsoever. So just briefly, I wanted to talk about the various blood vessels. So arteries carry oxygenated blood. Uh, the aorta is one of them. Uh, the uh, carotid artery in your neck is another. Uh, they're high pressure uh, vessels. They carry uh, the high pressure blood coming from the left side of the heart. And then they turn into smaller arteries called arterioles. These are they begin to get closer and closer to the target organs. They eventually turn into capillaries or microcirculation. And this is what actually surrounds the tissue that allows the exchange of oxygen like we talked about earlier. And then, then the, the, the removal of carbon dioxide. Once the carbon dioxide is picked up and the oxygen is offloaded, uh, then the venules pick up this, this deoxygenated blood, returns back to the veins, finally goes to the vena cava, back to the heart for recycling essentially. So as EMTs, um, at least in this course, one of the very first things you're going to learn is, is obtaining a set of vital signs. And one of our most important vital signs is checking for a pulse. And I know you, you guys did this in your CPR class, checking for a carotid pulse. Um, the reason why these are called pulse points is these are the six most common areas where it's easy to feel a pulse. And that's because the artery is close to the skin and it's probably overlying a bone. So we can press, as we press in to check for a pulse, we're pressing that artery against the bone. It helps to stabilize it and give us a, a like a pressure point, basically. Uh, the most common, of course, here is the radial artery. You can see it's around that radial side, the thumb side. We'll check this on people who are awake and alert, medical trauma patients that are talking to us. We'll check their radial pulse first. If the patient's unconscious, um, or not responding appropriately to us. We'll check a carotid pulse. 
uh, on the neck here. If you if you put your fingers, your two fingers on the on the trachea, on the larynx right there, that the Adam's apple, and you slide your fingers uh, to the side into the little notch between the trachea and the muscle, you'll feel your carotid pulse. Um, femoral pulses, this is in the groin, this is down in the groin area where the leg meets the torso. You push in, you'll feel the femoral pulse. This is probably the last pulse that we'll be able to feel on someone with really low blood pressure. So if you can't find a carotid pulse and you think they might have a pulse somewhere, um, try the femoral. Um, when you're checking pulse motor and sensation distally to the extremities, uh, you can check the radial pulse, obviously, on the on the upper extremities, but in the lower extremities, we use the posterior tibial artery or the salus pedis ar arteries. You can see where they are. Um, the posterior tibial is on the in the medial side, uh, behind the the uh, ankle bone right there, and then the salus pedis is on the top of the foot, or the dorsal surface of the of the foot. We also have the brachial artery, which is in the the crook of the arm, if you bend, if you flex your arm, that area that flexes right there, it's called the antecubital area. Uh, you can feel where the brachial artery goes down uh, on the medial side and the inside of your, uh, your arm under your bicep and it wraps around and comes into that space and splits off into the ulnar and radial artery there. You can place your finger. If you find your bicep, your bicep muscle, the, the flexing muscle, people flex their arms, you can go to the where the base of the you, you go distally to where the bicep muscle ends right there in that crook of your elbow. If you take your two fingers and slide your fingers medially towards the inside and push in, you should feel your brachial artery. So, like I mentioned before, there's four basic components of blood. Uh, red blood cells uh, transport oxygen. White blood cells are our immune system. They fight infection. Platelets, uh, they clot. So if you cut yourself, they, they create those clots and those scabs that you see. Plasma, like I mentioned before, is the liquid that everything floats in, essentially. Uh, your blood is mostly plasma mostly water essentially, and the rest of it is all the other things that float in there. Ultimately, uh, the best way to treat critical blood loss, if someone's bleeding to death, the best way to treat them is a, one, if you can get to it, stop the bleeding, plug the hole with your fingers or some type of dressing, and then rapid transport to the hospital. And they need, ultimately, they need whole red blood as a transfusion. Uh, they've lost whole red blood, and if you lose your blood, you cannot transport oxygen as effectively, so they need that replaced. So we, we stop the bleeding, we keep them warm, we transport them to the appropriate hospital, and at the hospital they get the treatment they need, which is going to include the replacement of the blood they lost. So I've been kind of talking about this a little bit throughout the lecture, but uh, the definition of perfusion is the delivery of oxygen and glucose nutrients to the tissues and then the elimination of waste products, and primarily going to be carbon dioxide. Uh, if this is somehow interrupted by something, uh, allergic reaction, gunshot wound, blood loss, uh, some kind of infection, then they're going to go into a state of hypoperfusion, which is also known as shock. So be familiar with the definition of perfusion. So moving on to the nervous system, there's two sections of your nervous system. There's central nervous system, and there's the peripheral nervous system. So your brain, your brain stem, your spinal cord make up your central nervous system. Everything else is peripheral. All the nerves leading off of your spinal uh, column, all the nerves in your arms and legs and skin, all that uh, is considered peripheral nervous system.
So here's a diagram of the central nervous system. You can see the cerebrum is your conscious thought, your thinking, atoms, and subtracting. Your midbrain is your muscle control, and your uh, brainstem is your life support system. And there's your uh, spinal cord going down. Um, what I wanted to point out is that we do have what's called cranial nerves, and they pass through the basilar skull plate. Uh, once they leave the cranial vault, uh, they're considered to be uh, peripheral nerves, but what I wanted to point out is that they do cross left to right and right to left. So this, this, this plays a role in what people who have strokes. So if you have damage to the right side of your brain, you're having a stroke on the right side of your brain, that person is going to have paralysis on the left side of their body. If they're having a stroke on the left side of their body, they're going to have paralysis on their right side of their uh, of their body. This is called contralateral response. So not that it plays a gigantic role for us in the field, but just realize that these nerves do cross. So when it comes to the nervous system, we have what's called a voluntary nervous system, and that's just you basically walking and talking and chewing and those kinds of things. You have control over it yourself consciously. Um, most of what happens is in the background due to the autonomic nervous system. And we have we have two subdivisions of that. And one's called the sympathetic nervous system and one's called the parasympathetic nervous system. Now the sympathetic nervous system is the adrenaline uh, nervous system. So this is, is releases ad adrenaline from the adrenal glands and it provides all that fight and flight type of of um, responses. It increases your heart rate. It increases your breathing rate. It increases your blood pressure if necessary. Um, it open it, it opens up your lungs. It bronchodilates your lungs. It does all kinds of things. Uh, the parasympathetic is more of the um, just the opposite. It it slows down your heart rate. It calms down your body. Um, the the two the two terms you might hear is the sympathetic is the fight and flight response and the parasympathetic is called the feed and breed response. I'm sure that um, you had a big meal and then after that big meal you felt really tired and all you wanted to do was lay down and take a nap. Well that's your parasympathetic system taking over. It wants you to digest that food so it shunts blood from your the rest of your body goes towards your goes to and around your in your digestive tract to help to process that food. And it wants you to rest because it more easily digested. Um, when you are hungry and you haven't eaten for a number of hours, your sympathetic nervous system recognizes this, that you're low on blood sugar. And one thing it can do is it, it can help to release stored sugars in your body to maintain your blood sugar until you can, you can eat. So these two systems kind of balance each other out. They're constantly working. They're, one's getting stronger, one's getting weaker every minute of your life. But remember that the sympathetic nervous system is your, is your adrenal glands releasing adrenaline, and it's a fight and flight response. And the parasympathetic is the feed and breed. That's just the opposite responses. So I don't know if any of you guys uh, have Windows-based computers, but I'm sure at some point, if you if you do, you probably uh, got to meet the blue screen. And the blue screen means, as you probably know, that your your computer crashed. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because when someone goes unconscious, if you think about the brain as a computer, and if you get hit in the head with a baseball bat. Or you slam your head in the windshield in a car accident, or you fall off your bicycle and whack your head on the on the ground. Basically, your brain gets blue screened, and it goes it goes into scramble mode, and it takes a while for your brain to reboot. Because just like with your Windows based computer, if you see the blue screen, you just shut everything down and start it up again. Well, the reason why I bring this up is because depending on how long the person's unconscious will tell us a lot of how serious the head injury might be. 
So if you get you fall off your bicycle and you get knocked out for 30 seconds and you wake up and you're fine, that's pretty minimal damage to the brain. But if someone gets falls off their horse or their bicycle or their motorcycle and hits their head and they're unconscious for five, six, seven, ten minutes, or they don't wake up at all, they're in blue screen and their, their brain is so damaged it can't reboot. So that's why when we're when we're encountering people that have lost consciousness or still unconscious, I want to know how long they were unconscious for. Because the longer that they were out of it, the greater chance that there's significant damage to the brain. So what causes a person to go unconscious is the brain gets somehow gets stunned or damaged. And we have the two hemispheres of the brain, the left and right hemisphere of the brain. If, if both hemispheres get stunned or damaged or affected in some way, you'll find the person unconscious. If the reticular activating system, we have this area of our, this area of our brain that is our sleep-wake center. It's what tells us when to wake up and when to go to sleep, essentially. If your RAS system gets stunned in some way, maybe a blunt force trauma to the head or maybe some kind of infection, a swelling to the brain, whatever it might be, you will lose consciousness. So if you think about it, if a person's unconscious or they have an altered mental status or they're not acting normally, the organ that's always going to be involved is going to be the brain. Whatever the reason is, whether it's drugs or alcohol or fever or infection or trauma, if the, if you, the person is not presenting normally, uh, me mentally wise, the brain's been affected in some way. Now, just briefly on the endocrine system, I don't want to get too deeply into this, uh, but the two areas that we're concerned about because we do interact with these, these glands uh, pretty commonly. So the endocrine system is made up of these glands that release uh, these chemicals that really control our body, our growth, our sexual desires, uh, reproductive uh, metabolism, a lot of different things. But I wanted to point out two of them in particular. One I've kind of talked about already quite a bit, and that's the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands release adrenaline, and that's your fight and flight. That's your sympathetic nervous system. And this plays a big role in what we see in the field and how we assess patients, because if they're in the fight and flight mode, you're going to see the pale, cool, sweaty skins. You're going to notice that their heart rate is accelerated because it's one of the things that, that, that the adrenaline does. It increases your heart rate. And these are great tells for us because if, if again, if adrenaline is being released, then we know this person either, either physically or emotionally has been subjected to some kind of insult, whether it's a disease or whether it's a, a, a emotional breakdown or whatever it might be. Um, they have this physiological response to whatever's going on, which manifests itself with this fight and flight uh, signs and symptoms. Now, the pancreas, like I mentioned way back when, is the pancreas produces uh, hormones to control your blood sugar. So the two that one is, is called insulin, and the other one is called uh, glucagon, and these two substances help to maintain your normal blood sugar level range. And uh, insulin, its purpose basically is to uh, reduce the amount of sugar in your bloodstream. So if you have a big lunch, you have that double burrito and the Coke and whatever, and you go to, you know, take a rest to digest, all those sugars enter your bloodstream and your body recognizes an increase of blood sugar level, so your body releases insulin, and the insulin draws off the excess sugar that you don't need and stores it, usually in your liver or other lar or, or large muscle groups for later use. Now, the glucagon is the opposite. You haven't eaten for a number of, number of hours. You're really, really hungry. Your body recognizes that your blood sugar is dropping, below normal, and it, it releases adrenaline, which then releases 
uh, glucagon, which promotes the release of the stored sugars in your liver to help keep your blood sugar up until you can get to go eat something. So these two hormones, insulin and glucagon, work opposite one another to maintain some type of normal blood sugar level in the normal healthy person. This all, of course, gets skewed if the person is a diabetic because then they don't have the, the insulin to help control their sugars. Now they have to take it artificially, either orally or by injection, and it changes this whole thing. But in a healthy person, this is the way the pancreas uh, functions. Now I've been talking a lot about adrenaline and the two properties that are that make up adrenaline are called epinephrine and norepinephrine. I'm going to go over the the different functions of these substances and how they affect the body. And like I mentioned previously with adrenaline you have uh, these different effects on the body and the substances that are that make up adrenaline epinephrine and norepinephrine we have alpha properties and beta properties so alpha 1 constricts blood vessels so if your body recognizes your blood pressure is slightly low it releases adrenaline it tightens up your blood vessels if you constrict your blood vessels um, it increases your blood pressure now alpha 2 regulates the effect so it can't get too constricted it helps to control uh, that from happening too much Beta-1 increases your heart rate, and it also makes it, it beat more effectively and efficiently. So again, if, you're, if your body recognizes you, have a, you need to pump more blood around faster, it releases this, this, uh, these products. It causes vasoconstriction, it increases your blood pressure, increases your blood pressure, and increases your heart rate, which also increases your blood pressure, so you're moving blood around more quickly, more efficiently, and more effectively. Uh, beta-2 dilates smooth muscles, and this is specifically in the lungs. This is a beta-2 specific uh, bronchodilator, essentially. And that helps you because if you dilate smooth muscle in your lungs, if you open up your bronchial tubes, more air gets into your alveoli, more air gets exchanged, so if you increase your heart rate, if you increase your blood pressure, and you increase your flow of air into and through the alveoli, you've just improved your perfusion. So when someone is going into shock due to blood loss or some type of trauma or medical problem, this is one of the reasons why your body releases adrenaline. It wants to perform all of these very positive effects to keep you alive by Constricting your blood vessels, it helps to raise your blood pressure. By making your heart beat more effectively, it beats faster and more effectively and gets blood around the body quicker. It gets more air into the lungs because you've dilated the uh, bronchial tubes. And all this works together to improve perfusion in this, while well, you're having the state of whatever's going on. You're in shock or you're having a car accident, you have some kind of serious problem. Now, I'm sure you've heard about people have auto-injector EpiPens, uh, people with asthma or people who have allergic reactions, serious allergic reactions. The same epinephrine that's in the auto-injector has these same four basic properties. They do the exact same thing. Uh, people who are, are in uh, serious allergic reactions, they, what's called anaphylactic shock, they can have really low blood pressure well, of course, if you constrict your blood vessels and you increase the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of your heart, that's going to help raise your, your blood pressure. If you're having bronchoconstriction due to the allergic reaction, the beta-2 aspect of this is going to dilate your, your bronchial tubes, make you breathe better. So this is why people have these rescue EpiPens that they stab themselves with uh, and we actually, as EMTs, you, you will carry them on the ambulances and fire trucks, and you'll be able to administer this directly on a standing order uh, in California now. So this is an important concept, you guys to understand. You should, you should know alpha and beta uh, products of epinephrine really, really well from now until the end of the, uh, the course. 
So the skin, the skin is made up of uh, three layers. Uh, there's the epidural or the epidermis, and that's the outer skin. The dermis is the middle, thicker layer, and that's where all the functional units are in. So in, in the dermal layer, you have sebaceous glands, you have nerve endings, you have hair follicles, blood vessels. So that's the kind of the functional layer. And then you have what's called the subcutaneous layer, which is the padding. And this these three layers make up your skin. The skin itself has two purposes. One, this sounds pretty obvious, but it holds everything in. It, it protects us from infection. It protects us from the outside elements. But it also uh, helps us control our body temperature. In, in, in conjunction with your blood vessels, in conjunction with your hypothalamus, you have this ability to, to control your body temperature. If you get overheated, you sweat. So your body releases liquid, it gets onto your skin, air blows over your skin, and you cool yourself. Also, if you get really, really hot, uh, it, will, it, will, it will cause a rush of blood to come to your skin. So more that more that blood comes to your skin, comes into contact with the outside air, it cools that blood, kind of by like the, like the water is cooled in your radiator, your radiator of your car, and then it's returned back to the core of your body to cool you down. If you're really cold, if you're out in the snow somewhere, then that blood is shunted to the core to protect it from the environment. So the skin does a really good job of trying to maintain our, our normal body temperature. You can see though, there's a problem. As you get older, as you become elderly, your skin gets thinner and less effective. So it has less protection for your body and also it's less able to control your body temperature. And this is why older people are very, very, very prone to hyperthermia, which is high body temperatures, and hypothermia, which is low body temperatures, um, because they, they can't control their own body temperature as, as effectively as a young, healthy person can. Young little kids, little babies and, and toddlers, they have kind of the same problem. They have, they have an immature hypothalamus and, and, and their skin's not very effective yet. So they're also prone to hypothermia and they're also prone to hyperthermia uh, due to some kind of environmental condition like a child being locked in a hot car. They can die from that because they can't control their body temperature. A child being immersed in icy water, same kind of thing. A little old lady trapped in their house on the, on the floor because they can't get up and they're lying underneath a, um, an air conditioning unit and it, cold air is blowing over them, uh, they can very quickly go into hypothermia uh, due to that environmental problem. So let's talk about the renal urinary system. Uh, our kidneys their uh, purpose is to filter blood. They filter out uh, dead blood cells. Uh, they filter out uh, all the excess ions, potassium, sodium, all those things, calcium, things we don't need excess of. Uh, also, they help to control our uh, the amount of liquid we have in our body. So if we have too much water in our system, they will help eliminate it by creating urine. So this urine is developed in the kidneys, and it's sent down to the ureters, those funnel-shaped tubes going down off each kidney, and they wind up in the bladder. The bladder has, it's a hollow organ, has stretch receptors in it, and when it fills to a certain point, it tells the person they got to pee. I'm sure you've all felt that. Uh, in a male, what happens is, is the urine has to pass through the, uh, the, the urethra, which is the tube that goes from the bladder out to the to the toilet, so to speak, and for guys, guys have have two um, little uh, sphincters. One sphincter is before the prostate gland, and one is after. So for a guy to urinate, they have to open up the first sphincter, and then it has to simulate the second one to get urine to come out. So it's a little harder for guys to urinate sometimes, and I and I don't know if any guys have felt this before, but sometimes. When you go to the bathroom, you got to think about it for a second, uh, and that's because these two sphincters have to open. A girl's, um, their urethra is all internal pretty much, 
and they only have one sphincter and they can urinate pretty easily uh, because of that. Uh, problems that can occur the most commonly are going to be kidney stones and those are calcium uh, de uh, deposits developing into these uh, kidney stones. They break free from the kidneys, they float down the, uh, the ureters and they cause all kinds of problems, all kinds of pain. Um, people do get kidney failure uh, from uh, diabetes will cause this, uh, trauma will cause a temporary kidney failure. People who, who have critically injured trauma are, are critically injured trauma patients. What happens is as they're losing blood, their kidneys will shut down automatically. It's a protective mechanism to kind of retain that fluid in their body but it might take weeks or months after the accident for their kidneys to, to reactivate, to start filtering again. So in the meantime, they might have to go to, to a dialysis center to get dialyzed, to get the waste products removed artificially through a machine. People with chronic kidney failure, they have to be dialyzed three days a week for the rest of their lives. They have to go to, 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 to a dialysis center. And the most common cause of kidney failure, chronic kidney failure, is diabetes because the high sugar levels of the diabetic leads to uh, renal failure. So let's talk about the reproductive systems, male, female. The female reproductive system uh, we're talking about, so you have the ovaries and they produce the eggs and then you have the fallopian tubes that the eggs will travel down when the mother, when the woman ovulates every month, and they go into the uh, uterus. If the egg meets a sperm, the woman's sexually active, and they and they uh, they conceive. The now fertilized egg will attach to the uterine wall, and it'll reproduce in a period of approximately nine months or so. The, the, the woman will, uh, will give birth to a, a healthy child. Um, structurally, you have the vaginal canal, which is the birth canal, and then at the pr at proximal end of that, where it meets the uterus, there's the cervix, and the cervix gets plugged with a little waxy plug when the mother does con start to conceive and, and has a baby. Uh, the uterus does expand with the growth of the child. It gets obviously very large. And it's a muscle, so it helps to push that baby out through the birth canal during the birthing process. Uh, for me, the most common thing I encounter as a paramedic, and you will as an EMT, is uh, when it comes to reproductive issues with women, is going to be probably a miscarriage. This is the woman who's, uh, who's pregnant. It usually happens in what's called the first trimester, which is the first three months of her pregnancy. Um, the body just naturally recognizes this child, you know, this fetus is, is not viable and it rejects the fetus and it wants to flush it out and it uses blood to do so. So it, it, it detaches this, um, this embryo, I guess, from, or even fetus sometimes if they're far enough along, from the wall of the, uh, of the uterus and it flushes out with blood. So the chief complaint is going to be they're vaginally bleeding and they have pain and cramping to their lower uh, abdominal area. And if you listen to them carefully, they're sexually active. Either they know they're pregnant or they haven't had a period in a few months and they, they suspect they're pregnant, but there's more than likely going to be a miscarriage. In most cases, it's not life-threatening. There are some cases where it is, but in most cases it's not. It's very emotional for them. Um, you need to support them emotionally uh, let them know that they have not failed, that it's this per perfectly normal, natural process, um, and give them all this, the, the, the support you possibly can. Don't be surprised. They'll be embarrassed to talk about it. Uh, don't force them uh, into discussing it. Again, it's a, you know, it might be the worst day of their lives. They wanted this baby very much, and, and you, you need to support them in their, in their, in their crisis today. You now, guys, on the other hand, uh, reproductively, pretty much everything, with some exceptions, is external. We have the testes, which, which is in the scrotum, um, which produces the sperm. Uh, we have the uh, seminal vesicles. We have the prostate, which stores vesicle fluids uh, for ejaculation. 
everything's pretty much external and uh, and you will encounter situations with guys especially where they have trauma to the genitalia. I had one gentleman who crashed his motorcycle and tore his scrotum and he lost one of his testicles. He literally ripped out and it went missing. We couldn't find it. You can only imagine from a male perspective anyway, you know, there's five firefighters and three paramedics there, all male. And of course, our focus was finding the testicle. <laughs> Go figure. But ultimately, it's not life-threatening. So what we should have really done is treated as other injuries, but we were also focused on the testicle. It kind of was distracting for us. It was also obviously distracting for the patient as well. From any, any male out there could probably tell you if you were missing a testicle, you'd probably be focusing on that. Um, I've also seen uh, uh, men who've mutilated uh, one way or the other their penis, so it's all swollen and deformed and bleeding, um, not on purpose, by, by accident, in an accident. And again, very uncomfortable for us, you know, in the field as well as the patient, very painful as well. Um, guys also are more experimental when it comes to uh, things. And uh, I've been on three or four calls in my career where males have inserted things in their rectums that shouldn't be there. Again, it's it's not our place to be judgmental. Uh, we can't joke about this. We can't, you know, put tell them that they were bad or evil or perverted because it's not our place to do that. Uh, it's human sexuality, and we have to realize that. Um, our job is to treat them symptomatically, uh, get them to the hospital in a reasonable amount of time, and turn them over to the doctor and let them deal with the problem. Um, once you start telling them how terrible they are, you've, you've, been, you've, you've, you've lost your purpose as an EMT. I've encountered uh, patients with pens up their rectum. I had one gentleman that had a Coke bottle in his rectum. I had another person, another gentleman, who had an uh, olive jar in his rectum. And all the three of these objects were, were purposely inserted. And you can only guess why, and, and that's cool, whatever, right? But again, whatever you think about this, however you, you view this from a moral perspective, uh, it's, again, keep it to yourself. Um, treat them as, as patients, treat them kindly, treat them sympath sympathetically, and get them to the hospital. The end.